Right. Shall we start, lads? Yes, yeah, rock and roll. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get let's prepare to be cancelled. 12 months on from Pierre Gasly's shot victory at Monza, the Italian Grand Prix has thrown the phone book out of the window for the second year in a row. Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast, everybody. This is episode number 135, where I'll be reviewing the 2021 Italian Grand Prix. I'm your host, George Housen, and joining me today, we have Tom Downey from the EF1 podcast. Hello. Aaron Harper from the Five Red Lights podcast. Hello. And Jared from the Hit the Apex podcast. Howdy. So, lads, let's start with the uh, the winner of this race. And as you can maybe tell by mine and Aaron's shirts, if you're watching on the video on our YouTube, it was unbelievably a McLaren. And a McLaren 1-2 at that, Aaron. Daniel Ricciardo finally getting the result, of deserving of a driver of his quality at McLaren. Lando Norris as well, coming home in second. No, this is not Groundhog Day. This is not April Fool's Day. We're being deadly serious. This actually happened. And you know what? It was deserved. Oh, it was. And I mean, th- there's a slightly cruel twist of fate in the fact that Lando has been so stunning all year. And then when the cards fall the right way, he ends up in second place behind his teammate. But credit where credit's due, Daniel drove brilliantly. And yesterday I kind of, I, I made him driver of the day for, for the qualifying sprint and uh, kind of hoped that I didn't put the jinx on him for today. And boy, he cashed in when he made a great start and that, that was it. That was the crux of it. He made the start, won the start, took the first corner and that was it. He held Verstappen at pretty much arm's length. He went as fast as he needed to go. And let's not forget, he's won, was it eight races or seven before today? Seven before today. Seven yeah. before today. So this is his eighth, eighth win. He's an accomplished race winner. He's been in the sport for a decade. So he knows what he's doing. Uh, to coin a phrase, um, you can't ask for much more. And this is the sort of thing that McLaren signed him for. This is why they're paying him however many millions of pounds to race for them. And alongside Lando, if they can deliver a car that is the equal of a Red Bull or a Mercedes, they are in with a massive chance of scooping one or potentially both championships. And if, he, if, if Daniel can take this sort of confidence into the next few races and close out the season really strongly. He's looking really well set for next year. And he even mentioned it himself that the, the August break came at a good time for him. He just sort of processed everything that he'd been through in the first sort of six months with McLaren. And he's come out the other side and he's looking really, really strong. He drove well to qualify fourth in Spa. The McLaren didn't really handle so well around Zandvoort, but they've, they've cashed in uh, big time. Uh, today with a one-two so for Daniel to do that is just I'd say surprising but it's the sort of thing we expect from him it is the sort of thing we expected him from him uh, before the start of this season but he, he took his time getting used to the car I think it's fair to say now he is used to the car he did very well in qualifying for Spa got a fourth place there he was close to Lando Norris at, at Zanvoort the car just didn't suit the track for whatever reason uh, but it absolutely suited Monza. Um, and like you said, Daniel Ricciardo, he had a hell of a lot of pace in his car, he even set fastest lap of the race on the last lap. That tells you that, in truth, he was probably holding back a little bit, if anything. And and to get this, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's not this This is the first win for McLaren for nine years. It's the first 1-2 for them since 2010. It's been 11 years since they had last had a 1-2. I mean, and of course, Jared, we have to say that, you know, it's deserved for a driver of the quality of uh, Danny Ricardo, but this is going to be an incredibly popular victory in Australia. Yeah, it is going to be. And I loved um, his comments after the race where he said, I just kind of stepped aside, you know, a message to the people who might have doubted him in the last couple of years, obviously leaving Red Bull where he had a car where he could win races. He was at Renault for a couple of years where only got a couple of podiums last year and, you know, McLaren was kind of a um, a make it or break it kind of move in his career. And, you know, this win not only like tells all of us that, yeah, he's still got it, but also might remind him as well, you know, he's got the capability of winning races like we've seen him in the past. And 
yeah, <laughs> just kind of speechless, especially, you know, it's McLaren, you know, everyone's second favorite team, probably your favorite team. And then Ricardo, who, you know, such a likable character on the grid, got to see the Shuey on the podium as well for a win. Um, and Monza is just one of those special podiums too. So, you know, great place for him to win. That's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic to see the Shuey back. And, and great as well for Ricardo, obviously. He does have his Italian heritage. He spoke a bit of Italian as well after the race. That riled the crowd up no end. I'm sure he said some very nice things about them. Um, yeah, it, it's, ju- it's just a real feel-good win. It's a win that a driver like Ricardo really needed because, you know, he'd been doing better, but he, need- he needed a podium. He needed a good result. But to get a win, to get McLaren's first win of this new McLaren-Mercedes era is, uh, is, is massive for them. It's going to provide huge momentum for them going into 2022. But the thing is, is as well, I mean, obviously the elephant in the room is that Hamilton and Verstappen, did they did crash out of the race, but Tom, they were genuinely holding both of them up. Ricardo was ahead of Verstappen. Uh, Lando was ahead of uh, Lewis Hamilton, but both were holding them up and doing so successfully. They never, they never really had to get the elbows out properly, apart from maybe a few times. So it, they had legitimately had incredible pace this race. Uh, yeah. Um, do you want me to talk about the crash or should we get on start? We'll, we'll, we'll do that after we've sure asked Lyrical about McLaren. Just McLaren. A bit yeah, longer. absolutely. I'm more than happy to ask <laughs> Lyrical about McLaren for another few minutes. Yeah, um, what a race. You know, like we said, first one, two since Canada 2010. Danny Rick just did, did um, you know, did Danny Rick things. You know, we should call it hashtag just Danny Rick things as, as he went late onto the breaks in, in turn one, passed his odd teammate, and off he went into the distance. Never really under threat, especially with the incident, which we'll get onto in a moment. Um, and his teammate was super as well. Lando was really mature. You know, we heard him over the radio say, um, you, you know, if, if you want us to hold position, all the rest of it. It reminded me a lot of, was it Eddie Jordan in possibly 98 in Spa with, um, I want to say Damon Hill and I can't remember who his teammate was. Ralph Schumacher. Ralph Schumacher, Who, Of yeah. course it was. So, like, I, knew, I knew it was a brother. Um, but and obviously it wasn't Michael, but it, it reminded me a lot of that. Whereas, like, we got an opportunity here for some really good points, and they held position, they held off enough from Bottas and Perez, who were circling behind. Um, and then obviously, without Hamilton and Verstappen in the picture after about lap 26, yeah, brilliant result. Danny Rick said he felt this is his best win out of the eight he's had, and I can kind of see where he's coming from. I think Monaco 2018 will probably be up there for him, obviously after the pit stop errors of 2016. But this race, you know, he's proved that he can win a race outside of Red Bull. And he's not had the easiest of years, but he's really sort of, after the summer break, it feels like he's kicked on a bit. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm just really pleased for McLaren, for Danny Rick and for Lando. Really pleased. Yeah, I'm so happy for them as well. It, 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 it's just it's just a real feel good win. Like I said before, it's um, something that apart from maybe probably Ferrari fans would, would love to see. I think most fans will just look at that and think, yeah, McLaren getting a win after all this time. It's you know it's well deserved. They've been on an upward trajectory ever since Zach Brown came into the team in 2018. I think he came in. You know they've improved year on year since that horrible year. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just fantastic. It's great to see. It really is great to see. Um, something that provided a lot of drama and something that perhaps we don't like to see in a way was obviously, we just gave it a quick mention there, the crash. Now, basically, Hamilton and Verstappen had another on-track crash. Um, Verstappen was in second behind Ricardo. Hamilton was in fourth behind Norris. Uh, Verstappen stopped, did his one stop, had a horrible pit stop, 11 seconds, I think it was, dropped in behind a bunch of cars, so Mercedes said, right, let's pit Hamilton. Let's get him out there. But they too had a slow stop, not as slow as Verstappen, but a slow stop. And unbelievably, they ca- Hamilton came out onto the same piece of track almost as Verstappen. They go into the first chicane. They collide, both out of the race, in the gravel. Safety car comes out. It changes the race. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot a bit here, Aaron. Who's to blame here, if anybody? Inherently, it's, it is a racing incident, but personally, I think a little bit of more of the blame lies with Max. And I always feel that the 
responsibility for not having a crash in most cases of an overtake uh, lies with the car trying to make the overtake. Um, there are some exceptions. You know, if you're trying to overtake Mazepin, I'd, I'd watch out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, they came out side by side while, when Hamilton came onto the racing line and Lewis left him space. And Max was well within his rights to go for the move around the outside of the, uh, the first corner. But he was always going to be driving into a disappearing wedge. Mm. For me, I think he's, the red mist had come down because of his slow stop. And I think just for that split second, he was so almost hell-bent on making up for that error in the pit stop, whether the team didn't have the nut tight enough on the right front or there was just a, a, a g- generic error. He was so sort of determined to, to make it right that he forgot to think big picture. And I spoke about this yesterday on the uh, qualifying analysis. He was, he was thinking big picture. He didn't go and attack Bottas when he didn't need to. Today, he attacked Hamilton when he didn't need to. If he'd squared up the car, because Hamilton was tucked up behind Norris, he could have got a really good run down to the Della Roja chicane and made a very clean pass. And then that would have put Hamilton in a, in a tough position. Ultimately, I think the stewards will deem it a racing incident. But I think Max has to go and reassess how he's going to go into combat a little bit because that that could have been a lot worse than it was. Mm, yeah, it could have been. Pre-Halo, it definitely would have been a lot worse. I think uh, Hamilton would have been in a very bad way with that, with the way that Stappen's car just sort of rode on top of his at the end of it. Um, it's a tough one. It, it's a really tough one, this, because... To be honest with you, when I first saw it, I did genuinely think that if I had to blame somebody for this, I, I might blame Hamilton more because he's got cold tyres. He's just come out of the pits. And a bit like his move on the first lap, you think oh, probably should play the long game here a bit. But then you can also argue the same for Verstappen, like you said, Aaron. Um, and I think what probably caused the crash was uh, Verstappen going on to the, going to the sausage curve. And I think he was... You could argue maybe he should have backed out of it, but you could also argue that Hamilton should have maybe left him a bit more space. It's overall, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a racing incident. Um, what, what do you think, though, Jared? Do you uh, do you agree with that? Do you think it's a racing incident? Do you think the stewards will punish anybody for this one? Yeah, I think it's probably going to go down as a racing incident. Though I do feel inclined to agree with Aaron on this one that you know Max is probably a bit more to blame proportionally I got the impression when he came out of the pits and had his little moment on the team radio that yeah he had the red mist and you know what if it was me I would have felt the same as well like going into that corner he would have wanted that corner just to try and make up for the frustration of the pit stop but sadly that sort of thing doesn't work and you know we're thankful that Both drivers walked away from this incident as well. You know, Hamilton did say, I think, after the race in the pen that his neck was a bit sore, you know, because he had a bit of an impact um, up above. But, yeah, like, looking back on it now, Max could have easily just just not tried to make the corner, you know, and, you know, he had the warmer tyres. He would have probably got a better run into the Della Roggi chicane as well. So... You know, it's that long-term, you know, bigger picture kind of thing that, you know, just for that split second, he didn't he didn't think about it. But at the end of the day, both the drivers are fine. Um, from a stewarding perspective, they'll just say it was a racing incident. But, hey, it's given everyone a lot to talk about. You know, it's drawn a battle line between the fan bases and all that. So we're going to see um, arguments to come, I think, until we get to Russia. Yeah, I totally agree. There's going to be a lot of uh, very opinionated people about this. And uh, to be honest with you, when I saw Verstappen getting out of his car, I thought, oh my God, is he going to go for Hamilton? Is he going to take a swing at him here or something? Thankfully, he just kept walking away. Um, something else. This uh, it's, it, it's, it's not clear cut either way. And I think in that, in that sense of it, they're not going to give anybody any punishment for it, I, especially since it's post-race and they're both out of the race anyway. Um, I don't see I don't see them handing out any kind of penalty for it, but I could be wrong. We could see something happen with that. Um, so we've got two people blaming Verstappen more for it. We've got me kind of 
probably blaming Hamilton a little bit more for it. Tom, what do you think? Are you talking about opinionated people? So here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is what we want to hear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can really see, bear in mind I'm a Max fan, I can really see the argument from both sides. Um, I think it will ultimately go down as a racing incident. And I think I, th I think the biggest issue in this collision was the sausage curb. Because if that yeah. sausage curb wouldn't have been there, Verstappen's car wouldn't have bounced in the terrifying way that it did. Because seeing the way that it literally just like sort of darted sideways and just nestled itself into Hamilton's Mercedes was pretty... I watched it and I was just like, oh, my God. Um, and then see, seeing seeing how close that rear wheel was to Hamilton's head and seeing the, mm. seeing the scuff marks on the halo afterwards is testament to the safety of these cars. And we should say, well, I'm certainly going to say that, first of all, I'm glad to hear that both drivers are by and large okay, if not perhaps slightly sore and very, very irritated, which I really understand. But going back to the incident, my, my feeling of it is Hamilton was coming out of the pits on, yes, fresh tyres, but cold tyres. And yes, they were new, but they were still cold. And Hamilton is coming down the main straight. I think he had DRS and RS. He might not have had DRS, but he certainly had a slipstream because he was pretty close. Um, and the speed differential was huge. So, and Max is on the racing line. So, so you know that Max is going to certainly look to go into that corner ahead. And when, when, he, when he and Hamilton were sort of more or less alongside, approaching turn one, there was room there. And then, and then as Hamilton moved, moved over, that room disappeared. I think, Aaron, you described it as a wedge, which is a pretty good way of doing it. So as Max is going into that corner, he sees a gap. And they're fighting for the championship. And both drivers know that neither of them, and when I say them, I mean Hamilton and Verstappen, neither, neither of them really want to back out. And they know what's on the line here. And they know how tight this championship is. Verstappen could have realised that, oh, perhaps, you know, the room's going to disappear and he could have bounced across those curbs. But he knows that that's going to cost him time. It could damage his car when the space was originally there. And he had also committed to the corner. So... I think it's, I do think it's going to go down as a racing incident. It was a pretty sort of sickening crash initially, you know, because it's rare that we see cars sort of pirouette like that. The last time we saw something like that was 2018 in Spa when um, there was that horrible crash at the start where I think Leclerc Sauber went across the top of Fernando Alonso's then McLaren. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it, it's... This is this is going to be one of those things. Like Silverstone, I'm not saying it's the same as Silverstone because it's a different different set of circumstances. It's a different corner. It's a different track. The track, the corner's got a different profile to it. All the rest of it. But especially as we've now got a week off, it's going to be a talking point for quite a while. That it is. It is going to. The discussion's not going to end. And if you guys want to get your opinion out there, if you want to let us know what you think about it, we we do go out live on YouTube. Join the live chat, uh, F F1 Grid Talk on YouTube, and also tweet us at F1 Chronicle. If you were, uh, if you want to get your opinion across, if you disagree with us, if you agree with us, um, yeah, we all agree that it'll probably be a racing incident, but we disagree on who is at fault, if anybody. Um, but the fact remains that the championship is still incredibly tight. I think it's just five points between Hamilton and Verstappen. Those two are still the only two re really silly in it, despite their DNFs. Incredibly, Hamilton's first DNF since Austria 2018. Like someone was, the commentators were pointing out, it's such a long, long time. Unbelievable consistency from him generally. But this year, it, there's been some incidents and, he, and he's not scored as well in, in Baku it was as well. So, yeah. Before we move on, George... Oh. Just wanted to raise the question, well, the possibility. Are we going to see the dark side of social media rear its head again? 100%. I am very I'm I'm glad worried about that. Yeah, it's yeah I am too. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm in some, glad it's not the right words, but I'm, now that you brought it up, I am worried that we are going to see some horrible things because after, after the Silverstone crash, 
some of the things that were said on social media about Hamilton, those people have no place in this world. Yeah, hundred percent, mate. It's, it's just disgusting, isn't it? I saw I saw some of them as well, and some of the things that we've had as well here on the podcast directed to our hosts and panelists over the years as well. I mean, there's some very it's an overused words, but it's true. There's some very toxic people out there, and they've all got they've all got a voice because of the internet and. Yeah, even if they're idiots, even if you shouldn't listen to them, those words are very damaging sometimes, um, and you definitely shouldn't say them. So, And unfortunately, those people tend to shout the loudest. They do. Yeah. They do. That's the thing. It's a minority. It's an absolute minority, but it's still it's... noticeable. That's the worst thing about it, you know. It's not like one person. It's it's hundreds out there. You know, it's, it's nasty. It really is. So, yeah, I hope we don't see anything like that, but if we're being honest here, we probably will do. So... So yeah, um, let's uh, yeah. So like I said, let us know your guys' opinions. Join the live chat. Get your opinions out there. See, you know, we're, we're more than willing to listen to you, and we'll reply to your comments as well if they're they're nice as well after the uh, after the show's done. Um, but yeah, let's let's move on to our third place man, um, Valtteri Bottas. Incredibly, uh, despite despite starting at the back of the grid, despite taking his engine penalty. He absolutely romped through the field, Aaron. I mean, last year he had such a hard time trying to get through after a poor start, but he was making a lot of those overtakes look easy and he's ended up with a podium at the end of it. Yeah, he has, but I think at the end of the day, he's underachieved. I think he should have won the race. Well, yeah, probably. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously, I think he should have won the race because the way it panned out, and okay, he wouldn't have gone into the race expecting to win the race but he, he did say in his post race interview that he expected he was going to be on the podium and okay he's achieved that but the way the race panned out he should have won the race because he made mincemeat of everybody else and i think as well he took pole position so strongly because his car would have been set out to maximize its, its strength down the straight and obviously Monza being a, a straight line dominated circuit, it got him on pole position and he steamed through the field. And then I think after the safety car, he was sixth behind the two Ferraris and he got past uh, those two pretty straightforwardly. And then he just got stuck behind Perez. And that, that's kind of what we see from Bottas. He just gets stuck. And then when he did make the pass, he overcooked it into the second chicane and then wasn't able to get back through. And he was on the mediums, so by that point they would have been pretty cooked. But he could have done a bit more a bit earlier. I don't know what Tom and uh, Jawa think about that. Well, well, you you could argue that, but would you not argue then as well that Hamilton and Verstappen underachieved while they were in the race because they couldn't get past McLarens, which are in theory slower cars. Yeah, but I think they'd have been set up to run. Well, maybe not so much for Stappen. He'd have been set up maybe to have come through the field a little bit and make up a couple of places, considering their, their one-lap pace. But certainly Hamilton would have been set up to run from the front. Um, and then going into quali- into yeah into qualifying on Friday, they would have known that... Did they, did they change the engine on Friday? They must, they, they must have. I don't know. I'm not sure. I they, think so. Yeah, I think that, so. that would tally. <clears throat> So he, he would have been set up to be able to come through the field. That That's what I'm basing my, my argument on. The fact that I think that the Mercedes crew would have set him up to come through the field with a fresher power unit. So, yeah. I, I shouldn't take anything away from him, really, because he, he drove really well. And to come from last on the grid and finish third is a great achievement. Yes. I think I just got a bit frustrated that he got stoked by <laughs> Perez when he looked like he could be, he could be in for a win. And that's the sort of thing that make makes or breaks you as a driver in a top team. When Hamilton isn't there, Bottas has to win. There's no two ways around that, really. Well, that's... you compare it to sorry, George, but no, you okay. compare it to um when Hamilton did that, it was at Imola. He he came back at the end and picked off all those cars and yeah. finished where he could. You know, he was able to do that. And I agree that Bottas had the quicker car. He had the quicker tires as well at the end of the race. He was on fresher tires than both the McLarens ahead. So, you know, I was a bit disappointed too to see him not get ahead of Perez and have a crack at the other two cars at the front. But yeah, you know, still 
give him we can still give him some credit for coming from the pit lane and or not pit lane sorry starting from the back of the grid and finishing where he did yeah it's one of them isn't it we don't know all the ins and outs of it and a couple miles an hour straight line speed at monza you know i I think part of it is that perez would would also have been set up to you know potentially go through the field and might not have expected him to go at the very top i mean yeah he didn't have a penalty but the plan would have always been to give Verstappen a, a toe uh, during qualifying. So it would have, it would have sacrificed his grid position like it did. It's, it's a tough one. I know what you mean. It's certainly not his worst race. I mean, there's, there's been some like, uh, I think back earlier this year, like he should have really stormed through the field in that one, but he didn't. Yeah, he just went nowhere in that race. Exactly. So it's better for him, absolutely. But yeah, you're right. When, when Hamilton retires, which isn't very often at all, but Bottas should be there. And that's ultimately why he's got the boot for next year and George yeah. Russell's in the car for next year but yeah again get, go, in the, go in the live chat have your say did Bottas do well today did he do good enough or is he still disappointing this season um, he's still in third in the championship despite Norris's wins so that, sorry Norris's second place that's something um, I've, I've got to be honest I thought Bottas had one of his best weekends of the season this weekend um, I don't know if it's perhaps maybe, maybe there's a part of it that he knows he's going to a different team and he's got a multi-year deal because every year he's been at Mercedes, it's been a one-year deal. So there's always been a, an element of uncertainty. And as good as Mercedes are, playing second fiddle to Lewis Hamilton, and if he starts beating you, that's going to drag any man down because Hamilton is one of the greatest drivers we have ever seen. Um, so, and obviously new power unit and a good toe in, in qualifying helped. But in in the, in the sprint race, not qualifying, it is a race, let's be fair, yesterday, um, even F1 don't call it sprint qualifying anymore. Um, but but yesterday in in, in the sprint, if, if you'd have covered up the driver numbers of both Mercedes and you saw one out lead in the front and the other one had slipped from <laughs> second to fifth, you'd have put the names the other way around. But Bottas, just, he did really well yesterday Today, he was carving through the field like nobody's business. Unfortunately, it does appear his tyres uh, dropped off a bit. But I do think that because Red Bull knew they, that Mercedes, sorry, that Mercedes knew Red Bull had a five-second penalty, they weren't that bothered about trying to force past them on track because they were going to get the they were going to get the position sort of de facto anyway. So they, they probably said to him, they said, you know, just just back off, stay within a second or two, you know, just stay within the five second window of Perez and you'll be fine. And, and, and they were probably thinking more in terms of constructors points at, at, at that particular point of, of the race. Um, Cause obviously third over fifth, you know, you know, gives you however many more points and Mercedes are marginally ahead in the constructors as it is. But I, I was really impressed with Bottas this weekend. I wonder if, if it's like a proverbial weight has been lifted for him. And if he's putting on a show for his, for his new Italian team. I, th- I think he's I, yeah I think you're right I think a weight is lifted off his shoulders I think I think he is uh, feeling a lot better for it because yeah it's, it was massive pressure that was on him before huge pressure more pressure than he's ever had to deal with in his career definitely so you know people you know everybody being on his back it's, it's not really on there anymore because it's like oh well you know you're stepping aside at the end of this year whether you wanted to or not it's deserved and you're going to get another chance at Alfa, Alfa Romeo so People just aren't expecting him to do as well as before in a way, and he's he's doing. Ironically, he's doing better because of it. So it's good to see. I want to see Bottas do well. I don't wish any ill on the guy. I want him to do well, but he's just not for the most part for the last few years. But this was definitely. I think it was definitely one of his better drives. Not as good as it should have been. Definitely. I mean, yeah. I think with the safety car, he should have won it. Hamilton would have won it in that situation. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But he didn't. He still gets a podium. Good points for. Mercedes in the constructors, they pull a little further ahead of Red Bull at the top of that. Um, now, normally, if you'd said that Charles Leclerc finished fourth and Carlos Sainz had finished sixth, Aaron, you'd say fantastic weekend for Ferrari. But because of how good McLaren have done, they've leapfrogged them back into third place. But that being said, around a circuit where most of it expected them to struggle, they were on the pace for the most part. Yeah, I think fourth and sixth is a fantastic result for Ferrari. I- didn't really think they'd even be in the top 10 in qualifying, um, like the, the proper qualifying from Friday. So for them to have been Q3 and then stay top 10 in the sprint and then finish fourth and sixth, that's a really good 
solid uh, home race. I mean, it's not ideal for them that McLaren have finished first and second, far from it. But fourth and sixth is probably uh, as best as they could have hoped for for damage limitation, uh, conveniently helped by the fact that Hamilton and Verstappen took each other off. So not all lost for Ferrari. And considering that Charles wasn't feeling very well yesterday and Carlos had a crash, it, you know, it could have gone very quickly the other way for Ferrari and they could have walked away from, from Monza with no points. Yeah, just... and it, once the safety car went in, it became very clear that they struggle for top speed and that they are almost always a sitting duck for anything that's quicker than them. So the McLaren would have come past, the Red Bull and the Mercedes came past, uh, but everything behind, which was like an, with the Aston Martins and the Alpines, they're not quick enough. So they were pretty much safe from them. Yeah, there was a, there was a big leading group of the four main constructors, four top constructors, really. The other guys were just well off and, um, but yeah, it definitely considering that you would not guess that Charles Leclerc was <laughs> was ill or under the weather at all the way he was driving. He was actually catching Norris and uh, Hamilton before the safety car, so he had an unbelievable pace this weekend and putting right, I think, a mistake that he made um, uh, last year. Obviously, had that very nasty crash at Parabolica last year. So to get a fourth place in that Ferrari this weekend, I, I think it's a great result for them. But they, like I said, they do lose ground to McLaren and the constructors, which won't help them. But it could have gone a lot worse. Um, Fifth place, and I think a, so, a solid-ish result by Sergio Perez today, Jared. Obviously, he, he finished in third, but the, I think he had, it was the overtake on either Leclerc or Sainz. Uh, he went off the road, um, didn't give the place back. Stewards gave him the penalty. He dropped down to fifth. I think all things considering, not a bad weekend for him, but he really should have given that place back. It was obvious that they were going to punish him for it. Yeah, it was quite surprising at the time when he didn't give it back straight away or at least before the end of the lap. And there was a bit of chatter that they were inquiring about it on the radio as well. So, I mean, we all thought it was a slam dunk, I'm sure. So he should have done it. And, you know, that's a bit disappointing that he cost himself um, a possible podium with that. But otherwise, yeah, considering how... He was pretty disappointed and not happy with with the sprint and everything. He did um, get a solid result today. And yeah, you know, keeps Red Bull within touching distance of Mercedes and the Constructors Championship with the top two guys not finishing. And, you know, that's what we like seeing Checo do is, is do a bit of hustling. So overall, pretty good. Yep, not the worst weekend for him at all. But yeah, maybe... Pr- Probably should, well, probably should have done better had he uh, give that place back. He would have only lost one place arguably, and finished fourth. But there we go with some butts. Um, so I want to bring in your guys' attention as well, the people listening to our new shop. We have a new store, f1chronicle.com slash store. And we have some uh, competitions for you guys as well. So everybody that's given us a five-star review on iTunes, we always give you a shout-out. That's not changed. But everybody that's done that has been entered into a competition draw where you can win a free shirt from our store, f1chronicle.com slash store for that, an F1 Grid Talks shirt that you can win. Uh, and fr- from today, any new five stars reviews that uh, go on onto our iTunes or leave a comment on YouTube videos also got into a separate draw for the same prize, another shirt. So there's two shirts on offer for the guys that reviewed before and the guys that are going to review or leave a comment since. Uh, and also the third one, third and final competition, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which we are so close to to subscribers on there, you can and you win a free mug for that. If you can, if you can give us a subscription on there, you'll get a free mug if you win the draw. So three competitions, hope that all makes sense. Uh, but yeah, just leave us a comment, subscribe, comment on YouTube videos. You've got three chances to win that way. So best of luck to everybody. That will all be announced at the end of the month sometime I think after uh, the Russian Grand Prix, it'll be, I think, I think Turkey's just in October. So, yeah, good luck to everybody with that one. Um, so, seventh place, as it stands at the moment, is Lance Stroll, Tom. Now, I think he had a fairly decent day today. I think yeah. that's a good result. Best of the rest, in a way, if you will, with seventh place. But he is under investigation for speeding, allegedly, under the safety car. If he gets a five-place penalty for that, sorry, five-second penalty for that, he will drop down to ninth. But if he gets a 10-second penalty, he's out of the points entirely. 
So it, it could be a good weekend for Aston Martin or it could be another pointless one. Yeah, um, yet again, Aston Martin continued to go up and down more than a yo-yo. Um, I, I did see a bit, I think towards the start of the race, where Stroll almost barged his way past his teammate and then uh, then a few other cars followed suit. But Vettel seemed to lose about four places between the two parabolicas. Um but Stroll, in general, I've got to be honest, I didn't notice an awful lot of Stroll this weekend, but that's because there was so much going on in front of him. Um, that yeah, you know, it, it's, if if the position sticks, um, I'd imagine he'll get called to the stewards, or if he hasn't already been called, um, I, I know it's reported. I don't know if he's actually been summoned to the stewards. If um, yeah, if if you can hold on onto that ninth, it'd be, be a cu- couple of good points for Aston Martin. Um, yeah, de- decent drive for Stroll. You know, he, he's not doing anything wrong, but he's not he's not setting the world alight at, at the moment. Um, maybe it's, you know the car's not as good as the you know, previous you know the previous entity of, of racing point last year. Um, you know because obviously the Mercedes controversy with that, but but um, but yeah, he, he's he's doing he, he's doing the best he that he seems he can with the machinery he's got. I'd say. You know, he's usually into sort of Q2, just sort of like touching points, which is which is obviously what he's done today. Um, yeah. I've got nothing else to add about him, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, he was one of those drivers we didn't see a lot of him. He, he, he stayed out of the walls for the most part. Obviously, yeah, there was that contact with, uh, I think he said, I think it was Bell, wasn't it? He had contact with uh, towards the start of the race. Um, yeah, not a bad day, but if he gets done for speeding on the safety car, that's a, that's a really poor one to get a penalty for. That's that's something you should really be doing better with in, in all seriousness. You've got your delta on your steering wheel. If I can do it in the F1 game and not get a penalty most of the time, then the professional F1 drivers definitely should. Um, <laughs> um, but another guy, again, another guy that was kind of anonymous, Fernando Alonso in eighth place. And considering that Alpine were expected to struggle this weekend with a lack of power in their engine, I think that's a fine result for them, Aaron. Yeah, it is. But they've, uh, especially in Alonso's case, they've uh, benefited pretty hugely from three drivers who probably would have all been ahead of him, uh, either not starting or failing to uh, finish the race in Hamilton, Verstappen and Gasly. Um, Gasly obviously had his own issue yesterday in the sprint, but he did qualify sixth, and the uh, the Alpines could only muster sort of thirteenth uh, and fourteenth, I think it was. They were behind the Aston Martins, mm. but from there, that's a good result. P eight, some handy points. Uh, Aston Martin didn't pick up. Oh, Stroll finished ahead of Alonso, but he might be about to lose that, so they'll gain a seventh place, uh, which would be even better because then it just brings them slightly uh, further ahead of uh, are they, they're behind are they behind Alpha or are they just ahead they're of ahead Alpha they're still ahead of Alpha okay, so, I think yeah I was yeah, thinking they points. were close to yeah I was thinking they were close to Aston Martin um, there's so many A teams on the grid it's ridiculous <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah so that, that that's handy that brings them further clear of uh, Alpha Tauri then uh, and if the if Stroll picks up that penalty that bumps Alonso up a place, that bumps Ocon up a place, Alpha Tauri getting zero, that helps their championship cause immensely. And in, in that midfield fight, it's quite tricky to keep consistency. And Alonso's doing that. He's showing that he's still got all the race craft. He knows how to execute a race. Kind of anonymous, but you know, if, if Alonso's only going to finish P8, P7, it might as well be anonymous, not because we don't care, but because it just shows that he's there doing his job. And one once they get that car sorted, he might be in a position to challenge further up. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you give you give Alonso a good car and he's going to perform. He's, he's proved that. I mean, he proved that in, in the Hungaro ring earlier this season as well. You know, he's definitely got some incredible pace in him, despite being 40 years old now. But yeah, Alpine are just ahead of AlphaTauri, 11 points ahead. And I, I don't think they have as good a car as AlphaTauri, nor Aston Martin, but they're getting the results. They're picking up points and they're doing it consistently. If they keep doing that for the rest of the season, they'll get fifth. And that is massive. 
That is massive because that car is is not that good, I don't think. I'll be honest. Despite it literally winning the race this season, I think overall it does kind of struggle a bit. Um, I think the engine yeah. cover slows it down. Too draggy. Yeah, <laughs> it, does, it doesn't help. It's it's a, it's a chunky engine cover, isn't it? It's got to be a lot of drag on that, but it, it didn't seem to hurt them this weekend. No. Nope. Um, and another team that does uh, that normally does well. Well, sorry completely lost that let's start again <laughs> another guy that's making a habit of scoring points in not the best car Jared is George Russell ninth place two points again completely anonymous we didn't really see him for the most part that's how crazy this race was George Russell scored points in a Williams which you know a couple of weeks ago would have been a momentous occasion but he's done it again second uh, uh, two points for ninth place great weekend for them Bit of a streak, isn't it? Now he's on with scoring points. Three out of the last four races. Yeah, three yeah. last four. And the podium. That, that's that's yeah, and the podium. <laughs> um, that's oh, pretty yeah. amazing. That's pretty amazing. And you know, considering how we had all this other stuff going on in the race, we didn't take notice to to Russell doing it. And hey, um, if Stroll ends up losing seventh, that would bump Latifi up into tenth as well. So that would be another good day mm. for Williams. I think Alfa Romeo have just, you know, lost all hope of, you know, trying <laughs> to beat them in the constructors' championship this year. It's just, you know, that dagger is slowly just, you know, getting closer and closer. And um, yeah, it just shows that they did another good job. Um we talked about how Latifi out qualified Russell yesterday and then today. Um got ahead in the race and possibly I'm not I'm not even sure I didn't follow Russell's race really closely he might have benefited from the the safety car as well and getting that free pit stop um and then yeah splitting the two Alpine cars at the end of the day would have really done it so good job for George again you know it's it, I guess it's like you know he doesn't have to do any more to impress anyone because we know he's going to Mercedes next year but at the same time you know as as good as he can finish with that Williams will be will be better so yeah I mean I a bit like Bottas as well the guy he's replacing at Mercedes that the pressure in a way is off he scored his points and now he can you know he doesn't have to focus on it as much as what he did and he and he's Doing it fairly consistently, yeah. I, I think he did probably benefit from from the safety car. He was behind Latifi. Latifi, I think, did a standout job this weekend. If he deserves a point, I hope he gets one. Um, absolutely, but, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was he was great today. Um, someone who, in a you, in a way, kind of looked into a into a single point though was Esteban Ocon. Tommy, I mean, he had that crash with Sebastian Vettel. I don't know what he was thinking with that one. That there was quite a few. Con- Quite a lot of contact at chicanes, but that that was obviously his fault. But you know, to his credit, he has ended up in tenth. He did get a point for Alpine, and it might become two after Lance Stroll's penalty. Uh, yeah, I was just sorry. I'm just looking on the FIA website. There's nothing yet about Stroll getting a penalty, but they've got a few things to dig through. From yeah, from I think they're going to sort Hamilton for Stappen first before doing that. Aren't they? They're going to yeah. heads together. <laughs> Don't yeah. Um, who was I talking about? Sorry, Esteban Ocon. Oh God, thank you. <laughs> I think that says a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other, uh, you know, other, other than barging his way through past his teammate stronger than I used to barge through a door when I was drunk. Um, <laughs> you know, he was, uh, yeah, it, 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 again, sort of like fairly anonymous. Um, I was a bit disappointed to see Ocon get 10th because I really wanted to see Latifi get 10th and Latifi was running 10th. And I did get my hopes up when I realised that Ocon had a five-second penalty, but I think he served it when he pitted for new tyres, and he pitted as the safety car came out or the lap after the safety car came out, so it didn't really make much of a difference. Um, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, um, Ocon. I wasn't expecting Alpine to be that good this weekend. I think I spoke about it on the on the pod last week. Um, I thought that they were going to be relatively nowhere, but you know. Luck fell their way a bit. They they had okay qualifyings, um, but yeah, the, I, I mean to, to, to come eight and tenth for for Alpine you know, with Ocon being tenth, that's a pretty decent result, I'd say. It's more decent than I was expecting it to be. Definitely, I, I was not expecting them to do well this weekend. But to the credit they have, they've both got both the guys into the points despite being in the wars for uh, Esteban Ocon. Um, well, I mean, let's talk about Nicholas Latifi as well. As it stands, he's just missed out on points in 11th, Aaron. And like I said, I think he did a standout job. He was ahead of 
George Russell during the during the sprint. He was ahead of him during the race today. I think he was slightly hurt by the safety car, but you know, he was he was looking like a steady pair of hands, just going about his job and hopefully he'll get a point for it. Yeah, I think that would be uh a really good reward for him. He's he's quietly impressing everyone, isn't he? He's not yeah. this pay driver who's keeping Williams afloat anymore. He's showing that now that Williams have obviously got the financial backing of uh, Doralton Capital and that they've got a car that's pretty drivable, he can deliver some really good performances and that's only going to take his stock higher. He impressed uh, in some races in F2, which is kind of why he also got the seat at Williams. So he's clearly there on some merit. And everyone drink, everyone brings some backing, you know, like Lewis Hamilton brings the big brand Tommy Hilfiger to Mercedes, and that will help them. And the Latifi brand will help Williams, maybe in a more impactful way. But what is also helping Williams is his performances. He's driving solidly, he finishes races. So you can't ask for much more. If you're not going to finish in the points, you need to finish the race, give the team the data to then improve the car and understand the car. And he, he might get uh, a little bit of luck go his way and uh, Stroll will get bumped out of the points and Latifi will get promoted, which would be uh, a very well-earned point for him. And it would also give Williams another double points finish. Yeah, and it would uh, take points off of Aston Martin and bring that gap closer, just a little bit closer between those two teams. Unbelievably. Uh, but, could could uh, you imagine how Lawrence Stroll will feel if Aston Martin in their first season get outscored by Williams, who finished last for like the last three years? Oh my would God! Be quite Netflix would be on that for Drive to Survive, wouldn't oh they? God, I'd, yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to see the behind the scenes. <laughs> He'd release an. You're going. I'm not happy. Yeah, and could, <laughs> could you imagine how smug Claire Williams would feel as well? <laughs> oh my God! It'd yeah. be brilliant. Oh, that would be something, wouldn't it? That would really be something. I don't expect it to happen, but they're getting closer. That's the thing. If if Stroll does get disqualified, sorry, not disqualified, gets a gets a penalty for his um, safety car infringement, you never know. <laughs> what be the sweating for sure. If Stroll does lose the seventh place, what would the gap be? Yeah, up. so Aston would lose. Aston would lose six points. So they'd six be points. down to fifty-three. Williams would. Gain a point for Latifi and gain two for George Russell, so they'd be up to twenty-five. It's it's a it's a big old gap, but it's getting smaller. That's the thing. Well, if George Russell wins a race, <laughs> oh they God. go back to the Bahrain Outer. I'm sure he can put that right. <laughs> Don't <laughs> even go there because he'll get a puncture oh. and he'll come ninth. <laughs> we'll have another wet race in Turkey like last year and. So they'll only do two you. laps behind the safety car. Um, <laughs> chats, <laughs> but then they'll only get just, half points. Sorry, just just to jump in, um, this isn't anything concrete, so take from this what you will. But uh, I've just been told that apparently Hamilton left the steward's office, uh, and as we say, as we say, else, he was tamping to human raging, which means he was pretty damn annoyed. Um, and we all know how much Hamilton likes to give autographs for the rest of it. Apparently, kids are asking for autographs. He just went straight past him. He's gone back to the Mercedes hospitality. Take from that what you will. To me, that would suggest that it's being deemed a racing incident or Verstappen hasn't got a penalty. That's yeah. what I would deem that to be. I think you're probably right there. And I, I, he's not going to want to hear that. So. Yeah. yeah. Again, I'm just speculating. Mm. One thing's for sure. He is pissed. He is angry. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I know another guy who's going to be pretty raging after this race is Sebastian Vettel. Uh, Jared, he ended up finishing down in 12th after getting hit about three or four times or something like that. People just seemed to be attracted to his car and ended up suffering because of it. Out, out of the points, it's a pretty forgettable weekend for him, really. Yeah, it's <laughs> forgettable. That's the only word I've got for it, really. And it's you know, as much as we want to see Seb do well and everything, yeah, getting beat up by Ocon um, there. And then just, yeah, nothing nothing really for him. Like, he didn't have a great time in the sprint race either. I think he finished 11th or whatever qualified. So, effectively, he went backwards during the Grand Prix. So, you know, 
that's the thing. Like, I, I just want to picture Lawrence Stroll at the end of the year and what does he think about how the whole year's gone? Yeah, they, they had a podium, you know, they had a podium taken away, but overall it's been a, a hot mess for Aston Martin this year, you know, like big brand, a lot of new sponsors coming on board, big investment. You would have expected a bit more, um, you know, showboaty kind of results, but yeah, it's just just look look forward to 2022 and i don't know like if if you guys have heard speculation and stuff coming out about vettel possibly not racing next year it's it all sounds rubbish to me but yeah it's just like why bring it up i i don't i don't see that i've not heard any of that personally but i, I don't think that's going to happen i can he's, he's going to run his contract to me if he was ever going to give up he would have given up at ferrari last year you know he's a guy who honors his deals at the end of the day um, but yeah, frustrating times for Aston Martin. Very frustrating times as well for Alfa Romeo, Tom. I mean, Giovinazzi again, he qualified in the top 10. He had an unbelievable qualifying. He kept yeah. it, he held it during the sprint race. And then it just all fell apart today. <laughs> I mean, but at least, I mean, Kubica today, to his credit, I think he was very solid again. I don't think he did any worse than what Kimi Raikkonen would have done had he been in this race. But Giovinazzi has to be so disappointed with this result. Yeah. Um, I, I think Giovinazzi knows he's not going to be around next season. And I think the only reason they haven't announced it is because they don't want to... An Italian team at an Italian race does not want to announce that they're dropping an Italian driver because they might not make it out alive. Um, <laughs> that's in, in my view, that's the only reason they haven't announced the signing yet. But I think over the course of the next week we'll see an announcement as to who it is. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened to Giovinazzi in the race. Um, oh, no, he... He had he, the collision. He, he had yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. With um, Sainz. a Ferrari. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't remember which Ferrari it was. Yeah, and he just... Yeah, he, he just... Uh, he was just on the back foot then from, from there on in. He just, he just seemed... I think he locked up or got his braking wrong into the second chicane. And just rejoined, and I thought, Sainz, what the hell are you doing? Then I saw the replay, and I thought, oh, Gio, that's bad. Yeah. It just didn't give him any space. Yeah. It I was spun was... around because of it. Do you think that's just lack of experience of running at the front? I think it's desperation uh, a bit as well, to be honest with you. But yeah, that too. Uh, well, Claire uh, described him as a kamikaze in rejoining on the radio. He was. I mean, that's, that's yeah. an accurate description. <laughs> yeah, but don't forget that Claire put it in the ward in Monaco, so, you know. <laughs> Snakes and ladders. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, sorry, not sorry. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, um, Ferrari fans are going to be on you for that one, mate. I don't care. <laughs> Bring it on. Good thing he doesn't live in Italy. Yeah, oh, yeah. God. yeah. <laughs> God, imagine if I did. Um, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Gio knows that this is his last year. I do think, like Aaron, I think, Sorry, I think like Aaron just said, I can see there being an element of um, perhaps sort of like, or not immaturity, but sort of not, you know, he's only in his third season and a bit like Bottas, every season has been on a year-by-year deal. Aside from the two standout races or stand-in races he did for Sauber in 2017 when Pascal Verlein was injured. Um, But also, Giovinazzi, he's not like super, super, super young. Because people like Lance Stroll, Stroll is only 22. Um, and, you know, Verstappen's obviously only 23. You know, Lando's 21. Giovinazzi is about 27, if not 28. I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's born the year before I was. And I was born in 1994. So, Giovinazzi yeah. was born the same year as me. So he's nearly 28. Yeah, he's, 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 at, yeah. he's, he's, out, he's at that kind of age where he should be at the peak of his powers, probably with his experience and still yeah. useful kind of speed. Yeah, he, he, he's, he's sort of at the, as I like to phrase it, he's sort of at the shit or bust phase of, 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 of his career. And unfortunately, it sounds like his F1, his F1 career is going to go bust. It's just a shame. I, I, I like him, you know, um, you know, Jim actually does some holier than now things on track. Little Jesus reference, and um, <laughs> but he's uh, but yeah, but he's just he, he, he's not doing. Uh, he hasn't done enough, I don't think, especially especially with some of the talent that is not in F one at the moment. Um, I think I think he will be gone. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, Ferrari and Sauber talent that's coming through. Porsche, Eilat, Schwartzman, 
they're all putting a lot of pressure on him for that seat. Um, yeah. But yeah, he, he, he was just the architect of his own downfall there, really, wasn't he? I mean, did fantastic in the qualifying, fantastic in the sprint. And just done did it all. Back, back of the grid, recovered to 13. <laughs> That's not really saying much when there's only 15 finishes. Finishes, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, decent day for Kubica, though. Probably the last time we'll see him in a Formula 1 car anytime soon. I imagine that Raikkonen will be back for Sochi um, in two weeks' time. Uh, but yeah, the 15th and final finish, it was Mick Schumacher. Um, Aaron, I mean, again, another guy that we didn't really see other than when Mazepin tried to take him out again. Yeah. Um, there, there was a yellow flag and I saw the, the gap opening up and Schumacher dropped down a place. I thought, oh, the what's Kelly Mazepin thing, done? It. <laughs> Is it, there's only one thing that's happened. Then they showed the replay. And it was just one of those dumb moves that you just know Mazepin is just going to be famous for for the rest of his life, doing dumb things. And, yeah, it was just one of those, oh, Mazepin's hit him. Shock. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't think this was a really representative race for, for Mick. The car probably isn't suited to the circuit probably overweight, probably way too draggy. It's not got enough power. So it's as far away from a Monza specialised car as it could possibly be. Aaron, Aaron, sorry, let me ask you this then. What track is that has suited to? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh... <laughs> from, from what you just said, it should have been good as Zanvor. And mm. yeah. It, it I just think doesn't have enough to form with two, isn't it? Let's be honest here. At this point. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, you make a good point, Tom. It's probably not suited for any racetrack. Um, but yes, to get to the finish in one piece, despite Mazepin's best efforts, um, yeah, there's not really a lot you can say because apart from the spin, we didn't see Mick at all. There was all sorts of other things happening. Yeah, we didn't we didn't see much of him at all. Yeah, the, the spin was the only time we really saw him finish at the back. As you expect for the Haas, uh, Mazepin didn't finish what a shame um, but yeah those are all, those, those are all the finishes those are all the guys that went through there uh, two people we haven't mentioned though are the Alpha Tauri drivers and despite winning 12 months ago like I said uh, at the start very start of the show it was just an Italian Grand Prix to forget for them Sonora didn't even get started Gasly he had his he had his crash in the sprint qualifying um, he ended up repairing the car for the race he had to start from the pit lane but he came in after a few laps so it's it's a real contrast. A year is a very long time in Formula One, isn't it, Jared? It's it's a real shame for them because I think they could have done really well this weekend. Yeah, definitely. And with where Gasly qualified, and originally in like on on Friday, it was looking good, and then yeah, the crash um, yesterday in the sprint, and then at least they're going to save that power unit because they did put in a completely new power unit for the race today. They save it for, for next time, but for, for both cars, not to score points, it was pretty devastating. And Sonoda, I think it was like a brakes problem that they had and they couldn't fix it in time to get them out in the pit lane. Um, Gasly would have easily had, you know, top six finish if, um, all things have gone well from, from Friday. It would have been interesting to see if he did start the race um, from the pit lane where he would have uh, finished up. Like if they didn't decide to retire the car, how far he would have gotten. Um, the safety car would have definitely helped as well. But yeah, just points gone begging for those guys today. And, you know, they'll be hoping, like we said, that Aston Martin lose the points that Stroll would have got Um if they do indeed to give him a penalty. Yeah, it's it's still a big old gap between Aston Martin and, uh, and Alpha Tauri. Uh, Aston Martin on 59, Alpha Tauri on 84. So at the moment, it's a 25-point gap. But yeah, I've, no, a dismal weekend for them, really. And shockingly, they were the only team going into this that scored a point in every race, at least, uh, which I was really surprised to hear, I'll be honest with you, especially with how inconsistent sonoda has been. But I guess... Uh, Gasly's more than made up for it. Um, but yeah, on, though... Oh, sorry, go on. So, sorry, George. On Pierre, I, I uh, recorded my own episode uh, last Monday and then I listened to uh, your guys' post-race. 
uh, that afternoon. And I'd mentioned about Pierre talking to Mercedes. And then I listened to uh, the post race for you guys. And Tom mentioned about Pierre sounding out Mercedes as well. And that this could be another reason why he, he should move on. If he's doing like all the donkey work in that team and he's not getting any support from the second driver, if they're their own sort of fully fledged sis- sister team and he's not getting any help. Should he go looking elsewhere? I think he probably has, hasn't he? But he's not going to get a seat. That's yeah. why he's re signed with uh, uh, Alvatari for another year. Yeah. It, it, it was the best option Gasly had, other than rumours around a seat at Alpine, but that's been firmly shut down by our consigning a contract extension. Yeah. The sooner Gasly gets out of the Red Bull programme, the better. Yeah. And I said it before and I'll say it again. Hamilton is, a, you know, he, he signed the contract this year for two years, didn't he? So now. 22 and 23. Mm. Yeah. So after 23, you know, he'll be knocking on the door of 40 by that point, Hamilton. Not saying he'll get any slower, obviously, because he only seems to get better as the years go on. But he'll surely have won everything he'll have wanted to by then. Um, mm. You know, see, uh, the top team just putting out there. I mean, look at science. He's flourished since he left the Red Bull program. Oh, don't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just, and Ricardo, he's he's won a race outside of Red Bull. Yeah, yeah Sebastian Vettel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did for um, a bit. <laughs> yeah, he did for a bit, but no, not not the moment. He has had some great results this year. Some of them he's allowed to keep, and some of them, sadly, he's not been allowed to keep. But there we go. Oh man, so yeah. I'd like to see Gasly go elsewhere, but um, it's just a matter of trying to get your foot in the door somewhere else because all the seats are taken for a number of years. Um, you never know after after if Harrelson does retire after 2023, after his current deal ends, why not Gasly? Why wouldn't they go for him? He's proven he can do absolute miracles in that Alpha Tauri. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Maybe Mercedes will have another young young gun who comes up in the meantime. Who, uh, I don't. Emerges. I don't think they do. They've got. They've got Frederick Vesti, and then everyone else is like proper junior formula. So unless mm. Vesti uh, really pulls something out over the next couple of years, and even then, I he's in F three, gonna... isn't he? I he's F he's F three. So at best, if he moves to F two next year, and then does a year in F one in twenty three, I can't see Mercedes putting him in that team alongside Russell after just one season. No. So the do- the door is open. If Hamilton leaves, but then would they go for Verstappen or would they go for? I mean, Alonso would probably still want to drive at that point. At the right old age, the Mercedes. Can you imagine? (laughs) Oh my God! Yeah, we 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 can fantasize about this all we want, but yeah, for for now that yeah, it's it's going to be Russell and uh, Hamilton next year in that Mercedes. But yeah, we'll we'll see what happens with uh, with Gasly. I hope he gets a chance at a better team, but. I don't see it for a couple of years, probably. I'll be honest. Anyway, those are all the drives we've gone through. So uh, I'll start with you, Aaron. We've, you mentioned very briefly that you have, you have your own podcast, the Five Red Lights podcast. So what, what is that and where can people find it? Uh, so it's on YouTube. Uh, I do uh, race previews, which you've joined me on, uh, one for the cursed Belgian Grand Prix. <laughs> the race that wasn't, yeah. <laughs> the race that never happened. Uh, and then I do a, a race review where I rate everyone's performance. I do a driver of the month vote because I have a real problem with the driver of the day. Although actually driver of the day today was accurate. So <laughs> make of that what you will. Uh, and then I do a few other bits in between. I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. So you can follow me on uh, Twitter, at five underscore red underscore lights. And on Instagram, it's uh, five red lights. And then uh, you can find me on YouTube as well. Just search five, the number five uh, red lights. Yep, definitely check out Aaron's show. Like I said, I went on it a couple of weeks ago, and oh, I, I don't know. I don't know if you'll want me back on because maybe maybe my presence did curse that that race to never happen. Who knows? Um, but yeah, <laughs> definitely check out his show. He's got a lot of good stuff on YouTube. Uh, Jared, you too have your own uh, podcast as well, and I do believe it's on YouTube. But where else can we find it? Yeah, on iTunes, Spotify, and Google, you can find uh, Hit the Apex podcast. So and got my own twitter as well at hit the apex media um i w- would have plugged my instagram as well but 
usually I like going to racetracks and taking photographs, which I haven't been able to do much of in the last couple of years. So it's, it's kind of lacking in the uh, motorsport photography at the moment, but do check it out if you wish. I am at Dr. 46th TH at the end. So yeah. Something's telling me you're a bit of a Rossi fan with that. Uh, <laughs> with that, with that okay, <laughs> Doctor Who and uh, Valentino Rossi come together. <laughs> I'd love to see that episode. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, definitely check out Jared's show. Uh, Tom, of course, you are a member of the EF1 team and you guys also have your own podcast. Yes, we do indeed. So, uh, you can find us on... God, where are we? Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, the handles of those are at Join EF1. Uh, we have our Everything F1 podcast, which you can find on Spotify, iTunes, um, or, or, or your normal podcast listening locations. Uh, we also have a website, everythingef1.com, where we have links to all our podcasts on there. And we have a YouTube channel, which we have recently started to grow, where we do things like track profiles, driver profiles, all that kind of thing. Um, and we have our group on Facebook, which is our main sort of element, if you like, where we have coming close to 7,000 members, and that is the Everything F1 Paddock. We talk about F1, F2, F3, MotoGP, W Series, like anything racing is welcome. Yeah, definitely check those guys out. And as well on the podcast, they have some incredible guests on. Lawrence Barreto, um, Jamie Chadwick, uh, mm-hmm. Mark Priestley, a bunch of other ones I can't think off the top of my head now as well. So yeah, definitely I, check out those guys' yeah. show. I am possibly, well, I am organising a time with uh, James Hunt's son to come on as well. Ooh, that, that'll that be interesting. That'll be fascinating. I'm sure you have some very good Freddy. stories to tell. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely check out those guys. Check out everybody's podcast. And also, if you want to check out our podcast, if you want to check out our other episodes that we've done, we've got over 100 episodes now. Um, that, that includes the regular previews, qualifying, sprint qualifying, and race reviews, but also uh, more documentary-style ones like we did for and Senna, Tire Gate, uh, the 94 Benetton Conspiracy, and a pair of interviews with Mario Asola, the head of Pirelli Motorsport. We had another interview with him during the uh, Dutch Grand Prix weekend last week, so definitely check out those if you want to get some something a bit different to our regular shows. Also, go to our shop as well, uh, F1, F1 Chronicle.com forward slash store, and enter the competitions. Like I said, if you subscribe, if you comment on our YouTube, if you uh, if you leave us a five star review on iTunes, you can be entered three times for different competitions to win shirts or a mug. So yes, definitely check out those out. Uh, and as well, we are closing in on two hundred subscribers on YouTube, so be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Efron Grid Talk and ring the bell icon so you're notified for when we're going live because we put it out there before we put it out on anything else. But if you do want to catch the show after it goes live, it we're also available on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Verbal, Omni Studio, Pocket Cast, and of course the F1 Chronicle website, F1Chronicle.com. And yeah, we will be back next weekend to preview the Russian Grand Prix after the massive high of Italy. It can only get better around Sochi in two weeks. Thank you for joining us, lads. I really do appreciate it. No problem. Any time. And yeah, we'll see you for the next one in a week's time. Goodbye. That was a long one, but it was always going to be, I suppose. Oh, got some breaking news here. Max has been given a three-place grid penalty for Sochi. Oh, oh wow. has he? The, oh. the second we end, it happens. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just literally opened Twitter now and it's popped up. So, ooh, ooh, that... it, like six seconds ago. Is that That's... from? Uh, race fans and also Jenny Gow's posted it as well. It's legit then. If it's from Jenny Gow, yeah, it's going to be legit. Oh my goodness me. Funny enough, There's... I've just opened the. Um, the FIA website to, to check, but there's nothing yet. It's going to be legit, though, that isn't it? They're just not posted about it yet. That's uh, wow. Well, that is gonna, I mean, yeah. it might not make much of a difference to be fair, but the fact they've mm. come down on Verstappen, that's gonna, that's gonna piss a lot of people off. A lot of people are wearing shirts like this, but not for McLaren. <laughs> and all of got... Holland has just gone into riot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're on their way to Russia. Yeah, they're marching this, there now. <laughs> this is how World War.
starts because Max Verstappen <laughs> given a grid penalty. It's the butterfly effect. Max Verstappen has a slow pit stop. Then he crashes with Hamilton, gets a three-place grid penalty. Holland gets triggered and invades Russia. And Russia just, you know, then takes over the world or something. Yeah, that's, that is. So I, I think I think you know that Verstappen is just an agent of Putin. This is what he wants. <laughs> he's been he's been planted there. Uh, yeah, so it does sound oh, like yeah. a robot on the radio. Jenny Jarrow says that's a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got some comments here. Let's go through some of them. Connor Walker. Connor, Connor Walker. Yeah, he's always on it. Oh, he's, he's always the first comment, pretty much as well. Connor, if you're not, sus- I'm, I hope you are subscribed to our YouTube channel. Please do subscribe. Leave a comment in the actual comment section. After um after this as well because if anybody deserves to win some free merch it's you my friend but we're not being biased with this, um, but yeah he's put have you guys ever thought about watching the races live on this channel um we have actually I mean we did have a bit of a live com during the Belgian Grand Prix qualifying and I did like that I did enjoy that but I'm not sure I'm not that sure was what fun. we do a watch along just watching, is... just watching Tom's reaction to Russell going fastest <laughs> and my very delayed reaction to that as well that minute after. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a good one. That was brilliant. Yeah, we have thought about it. We have thought about it. It's something we might do because watch alongs are very popular. I see people like Tom F1 doing it, and yeah. he has a lot of people on there. We may, we may do it one day. It's a good idea, that Connor. Thank you. Um I'm just sorry, I'm just oh hang on. Offense car 33 causing a collision. Do you want me to read it out? Yeah, go on. Go on. Okay, so yeah, so 33, yeah, breach brother. Decision. Three place grid drop for the driver's next event. Two penalty points. Right. It says here, I'm going to bear with me. So Nothing for Hamilton then. It's just but purely Verstappen. Looks like it's purely purely Verstappen <laughs> um, at the moment. But given how pissed Hamilton was when he walked out of the garage, I'm surprised, but we'll wait and see. It just says, Might get a fine or something for not possibly, attending yeah. media duties or something like that. So you can't give a grid penalty for that. But it says here the drivers, uh, sorry, the stewards heard from the driver at uh, car 33. Uh, and yeah, you know, basically heard from everyone, reviewed the evidence, and determined that the driver at car 33 was predominantly to blame. Then it says Hamilton exiting the pit, Verstappen on the main straight at the 50 meter board before turn one. Hamilton was significantly ahead of car 33. Car 33 break late and started to move alongside car 44. Although at no point in the sequence does car 33 get any further forward than just behind the front wheel. During the hearing, the, um, uh, the driver of car 33 asserted that the cause of the incident was the, was, was the driver of car 44 opening the steering after turn one and squeezing him to the apex of turn two. The driver of car 44 asserted that the driver of car 33 attempted to pass very late and should have given up the corner either by backing off sooner or by turning le- by turning left behind the curb. Uh, the stewards observed on CCTV footage that the driver of car 44 was driving an avoiding line, although his position caused car 33 to go onto the curb. But further, the stewards observed that car 33 was not at all alongside car 44 until significantly into the entry into turn one. In the opinion of the steward, this manoeuvre was attempted too late for the driver of car 33 to have the right to racing room. While car 44 could have steered further from the curb to avoid the incident, the steward determined that his position was reasonable and therefore find that the driver of car 33 was predominantly to blame for the incident. I think that's fair. Because I agree. If, you, if you think back to Silverstone, Hamilton, I mean, you can get into the to the ifs and buts about it but Hamilton essentially was the car trying to make the overtake and then hit Verstappen and then he served a 10 second penalty Penalty. Uh, okay he won the race after that but he served his penalty you know it's like in a court of law you can't be tried for the same crime twice Mm. so you know with both cars being out I think a three place grid drop is pretty fair because of the next race if you think about it Verstappen he qualifies first he'll start fourth and there'll be probably his teammate and Bottas in between them. And we know Bottas is quick round Sochi. So that could cause Verstappen some problems. And then that, that'll add up to 10 seconds at least. So I think that, mm. that's just about fair. 
but also starting from the second row in Sochi as well is more beneficial than starting on the front row. So I like, regardless of whatever circuit, three places does seem a bit like nothing penalty, you know, given that they can get past. Um, I feel like they could probably get past quickly on the start. So yeah, I was expecting if there was to be a penalty, it would be, you know, five or 10 place drop, but yeah, three and two penalty points on the license. I think they're kind of halfway housing a little bit, aren't they? They're not going for something too severe. I can get why they've done that. But to be fair, you know, he'd only start on the second row assuming he gets pole, he gets fastest in mm. qualifying. He could well get third and start sixth. You know, yeah. making a yeah. big assumption with that because you can't count out the lights in McLaren and stuff either, especially given today's race. Well, and yeah, and I, I, I also think that um, Sochi is not going to favour Red Bull at all. It hasn't done in the past. We know how strong Mercedes have been there. They've won so, every time, I think, haven't they? Mercedes. I, I yeah, think so. Right. Yeah, and and obviously it's a pretty happy hunting ground for Bottas as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, it. Um, I think. Do you think so, cause, well, on, can I finish off? Oh, cheers. No, I was just going to say, I think of of all the places to, to get a grid penalty, Monza or um, Russia would probably be best for Red Bull in a weird way. Because they know they're going to be on the back foot, um, it's just a case of sort of like damage limitation for upcoming, you know, for races further into the calendar. Because if they're taking a good penalty at, you know, for, for engines, for example, at say Spa or the Netherlands, then it would have been a very different result. But we we knew how strong the Red Bull was going to be in those circuits. Mm. So. I was yeah, just going to say, do you think the stewards have only gone for three? instead of maybe a five or potentially a 10, like Joe had mentioned, to stop Red Bull sort of neutering that and just going, well, we've got 10 places, we'll make it whatever, and we'll just start at the back of the grid anyway. I, 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 I was going to ask. <laughs> I don't think so, because because so, I, I know I read through that document quite quickly, but it, there were some mitigation factors from Hamilton's side on it. Whilst the blame lies predominantly with Verstappen, it wasn't 100% blame with Verstappen, there, you know, there was some blame. Uh, sorry, not blame, but there was Hamilton some... Hamilton could have backed out of it. I mean, he was never going to, but in theory, he could have backed out of it. Ex- exactly. And, it. And, and, yeah, and that's... that's that he should have done. Yeah, and that's kind of what that document just said. So Hamilton could have, you know, eased out or, or whatever. So he's... um, Yeah, it, it's, it's not... You know, it's not like 100% in Verstappen's favour... Oh, sorry, not 100% in Hamilton's favour. And I think that's why they've only gone with the three because there are mitigating factors from Hamilton's side. Yeah. Hmm. I oh. do I do still keep coming back to the sausage curb. So if that sausage curb wouldn't have been there, it would not have launched Hamilton's car in the way it was. And we saw, we saw a bad accident at Monza a few years ago in one of the junior races. I think oh, it was Australian oh man. Alex Peroni in F three. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That. I'm sure. I'm I'm sure it was the weekend after we lost two bear as well. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but, weekend yeah, before, I think. No, it was it was at Monza, so it would have been the weekend after. Um, but but oh, yeah, no, so we lost two bear before, but yeah, that was oh, the so, week sorry, after, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, my bad. No, it's fine. Um, but but yeah, but it was just like. We've seen these sausage curves cause incidents before at the same circuit. I'm sure that was going through one of the Lesmos, possibly. That was Parabolica. Yeah, just Parabolica, was it? They, they, yeah, yeah, they, they took them it. out because of that. They, yeah. they had them before and literally took them out straight away. They were just like, these are going to cause a humongous accident, another one. And that's what they're doing. Without the, without they, the they halo. They used to have more at uh, the they first game yeah. because there was, a, there was a spin. I think it was maybe jean eric Verne. In 2012, he sort of had a half spin, came sliding across the grass, bounced over the sausage curb, and his car sort of went, oh, whoa. yeah, I remember that. And he, he was okay. Obviously, the cars, the way they land, it sends like a big shock through your spine, and that that's not fun. But um, I they used to be more sausage after curbs. That probably yeah, it. exactly. So they, they do need to think about what circuits they put these sort of sausage curbs at. They do seem to cause way more accidents than they prevent. Or lesson, don't they? I, I can't think of a time where I thought, oh, thank God that sausage curve was there. 
you know, they seem to cause accidents more than anything. I mean, like Paul Ricard this year, like, I can't remember who was compl- I think one of them, one of the Mercedes guys complaining on the radio to Michael Massey, who was just like, oh, this this is gonna this is gonna cause accidents, this is gonna cause damage to a car. Well, don't go oh, right, did, don't go wide they, then, mate. Didn't they you know, break it? That's on the a bad attitude. Curve. Yeah, didn't it did, it broke the front wing. Yeah. It just cause yeah, it just cause accidents. I, I mean, imagine I, that happens at the start of a race. Yeah, it's, 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 it, Well, we, we we saw it happen yesterday with Gasly. Yeah. yeah, front wing went under the car. That was yeah. He did hit another car, but it's the same sort of concept. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know it's not exactly apples to apples, but we saw yesterday. We saw a driver lose his front wing, and he got so he yeeted into the barriers. Yeah, because yeah. he, he didn't want to take to the runoff because he knew I'm going to lose the front wing anyway doing that probably. Yeah. And I, and I do wonder if that's why Verstappen didn't want to go over those runoffs because we've seen how rough they are. Yeah. I mean, I'd be, I, I'd be apprehensive to go across one of them. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd be apprehensive to go across it in my road car, never mind my, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, never mind the bloody race car. Yeah. But also, my, but also my road car's going in two weeks. I don't really care. <laughs> I've bought, I've bought a new one. So, I play, mate. I, I, I nearly bought the estate that they use for the, um, for the medical car, I nearly bought a C63. Oh, nice. But Very so, nice. Very Would you have nice. got it in red with medical car on the side of it? And, and the lights in here, Robert, to the passenger seat, yeah. <laughs> just, just use it to uh, to get through traffic at rush hour to put oh, yeah. lights on. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh. Right, lads. Well, I would honestly love to keep this discussion going. And thanks to everybody who's joined the live chat. My toddler is currently tearing apart downstairs. I can hear him. He's... Is rampant, so I, I need to go and rescue my, my girlfriend. I think, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about the incident and everything in the in the preview. It'll probably go out on Sunday, two p.m. British, uh, British summertime, or whatever, something like that. We'll keep you posted on the on the social pages. But yeah, thanks to everybody who joined us. Thanks, lads, as well for joining us. No worries. Um, yeah, Cheers, well, we'll see you soon. Rest, enjoy the rest of your weekends. Cheers, Cheers guys. See you later. Bye. Hey, happy Bye. Monday. <laughs> You're still Sunday. Oh, no more weekend for you, Jared. Enjoy, enjoy your week. Enjoy the rest of your morning. Monday morning. <laughs> Cheers, have guys. A good, have a good day at work, Jared. <laughs> you too. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> See uh. you.